The scripture reading this evening is from 1 Thessalonians, 1 Thessalonians chapter 1, verses 1 through 10. 1 Thessalonians chapter 1, verses 1 through 10. Paul, Silas, and Timothy, to the church of the Thessalonians in God, the Father, and the Lord Jesus Christ, grace and peace to you. We always thank God for all of you, mentioning you in our prayers. We continually remember before our God and Father your work produced by faith, your labor prompted by love, and your endurance inspired by hope in our Lord Jesus Christ. For we know, brothers loved by God, that he has chosen you because our gospel with power, because our gospel came to you not simply with words, but also with power, with the Holy Spirit, and with deep conviction. You know how we lived among you for your sake. You became imitators of us and of the Lord. In spite of severe suffering, you, were wel- you welcomed the message with the joy given by the Holy Spirit. And so you became a model to all the believers in Macedonia and Achaia. The Lord's message rang out from you, not only in Macedonia and Achaia, your faith in God has become known everywhere. Therefore, we do not need to say anything about it, for they themselves report what kind of reception you gave us. They, told, they tell how you turned to God from idols to serve the living and true God and to wait for his Son from heaven, whom he raised from the dead, Jesus, who rescues us from the coming wrath. Good evening. Good evening. Good evening. Good evening. <laughs> wow. Oh, my hearing was gone. Great to have you here tonight. Really appreciate your being here and... Uh, Good to see that uh, David and Bailey made it back. David preached at Morgan Hill uh, today, just up the road a couple of hours or so, and uh, said everything went well there, and I, uh, that's what David said. I asked him how it went and how the sermon went, and he said went well, and I will take his word for that at this point. I'm sure that it did. And we are glad that you're able to be with us uh, this evening and uh, want to uh, call your attention to the uh, passage that was read in our hearing just a couple of minutes ago. Thanks, Clark. Anybody remember Alf? But anyway, <laughs> I guess I didn't forgot that was up in the cabinet somewhere. <laughs> Thank you. But what I want us to understand is that when we think about the church in Thessalonica, it has a very, very interesting beginning. And if you'll take your Bibles and first of all, go back to the book of Acts. And I want us to spend just a couple of moments in in the book of Acts because this will take us to the Apostle Paul's second evangelistic journey. Uh, This second journey had actually begun uh, near the end of chapter 15. As it goes into chapter 16 and going on into chapter 17, we'll conclude in chapter 18. So right in the heart of Paul's second journey... And Paul finds himself in what we would know today as northern Greece. In biblical times, this was known as Macedonia. And Thessalonica was one of those principal cities up there to the north in Macedonia, uh, not too far from Philippi, Berea, we know. And in Acts chapter 17, beginning at verse number 1, Luke records for us, Now when they had passed through Amphipolis and Apollonia, They came to Thessalonica where there was a synagogue of the Jews. Then Paul, as his custom was, went into them and for three Sabbaths reasoned with them from the scriptures, explaining and demonstrating that the Christ had to suffer and rise again from the dead and saying, this Jesus whom I preach to you is the Christ. And some of them were persuaded and a great multitude of the devout Greeks and not a few of the leading women joined Paul and Silas. I'm reading the New King James Version, by the way, in case you're wondering. We continue on in verse number five. But the Jews, who were not persuaded, becoming envious, took some of the evil men from the marketplace, and gathering a mob, set all the city in an uproar, and attacked the house of Jason, and sought to bring them out to the people. But when they did not find them, they dragged Jason and some Brethren, to the rulers of the city, crying, These who have turned the world upside down have come here too. Jason has harbored them, and these are all acting contrary to the decrees of Caesar, saying, There is another king, Jesus. 
And they troubled the crowd and the rulers of the city when they heard these things. So when they had taken security from Jason and the rest, they let them go. Before we even read on, I want to ask you a question. Now here we are in Thessalonica. And Paul, as he typically has done in his travels, when he would move on to a new area, a new city, and often it was his practice to do what? To go to the synagogue. And if the circumstances allowed, he'd love to go to the synagogue even upon the Sabbath because they would be there. But this afforded him the opportunity to preach the gospel of Jesus Christ. Now it says that there was some marginal success there. That when you look at the text where we've just read, it, it, it says that there were some of them that were persuaded in verse 4. Even a great multitude of the devout Greeks, we have a very... Grecian territory, being northern Greece, that is Macedonia. But who is it that's going to give him troubles are going to be these Jews that are not accepting the facts about Jesus Christ and about the gospel of Jesus Christ. And what's interesting about this is that they make these accusations towards the disciples of Jesus, Paul and the others who so believed and notice the accusation and the appeal that these Jews used in verse 7 because they accuse Jason of harboring these disciples of Jesus. And these are all acting contrary to the decrees of Caesar saying there's another King Jesus. My question is this. How often did the Jews really support the decrees of Caesar? You know, it kind of reminds me back in the time of Jesus' personal ministry and when the Pharisees, the scribes and the Pharisees were always trying to trip Jesus off up and find some hypocrisy in him, some error, some, some mistake in him. And there was that time when Jesus was answering and answering their questions and was always well ahead of them that even the Pharisees decided to go ahead and join forces, if as it were, with the Herodians. That was just like a totally unheard of thing that those that followed after the household of Herod and the Herodians and that sect would ever be found with the Pharisees who were these very, very strict Jews. But isn't that interesting when there are people that have a cause and a cause they are not, they are not afraid to use deception and to make accusations that are just not true. Their appeal to the authorities in Thessalonica is that these disciples of Jesus Christ, these people that listen to preaching of men like Paul, they've turned the world upside down. And they are saying things that go against, the, they are contrary to the decrees of Caesar saying there's another king, Jesus. It, of course, is not accurate at all of how they are portraying this. We go on and we know in verse 10 then, Picking back up at verse 10. Then the brethren. Now these are disciples of Jesus. Now then, then the brethren immediately sent Paul and Silas away by night to Berea. And when they arrived, they went into the synagogue of the Jews. These were more fair-minded than those in Thessalonica. In that they received the word with all readiness. And searched the scriptures daily to find out whether these things were so, as we've brought out many times, that the contrast and the comparison that Luke is making is that the Jews, whom Paul was given an opportunity to preach to and teach in Berea, were more receptive to the teaching than the Jews in Thessalonica. It's not talking about the disciples or Christians. It's talking about the Jews in Berea they were more receptive. Why? Because they received the word of God with all readiness of mind and they searched the scriptures daily to see whether these things be so. And we often talk about the noble Bereans, and as we should, because of their attitude towards the word of God, the truth. But it is here that we find it very interesting that while Paul experienced troubles in Thessalonica, there was a congregation notwithstanding established there. And he had some success. And there were some that were converted. And a part of these some was a number. A number of devout Greeks and some leading women. Even as Paul had success sometimes within his journeys. He had in the previous chapter. <clears throat> in chapter 16 when he went to Philippi. Who were among the first converts in Philippi were women. Remember the household of Lydia? 
Now the point that I want to make here is that we look at this and we think this was really kind of an interesting beginning for the congregation, for the church in Thessalonica. Now most chronologists and scholars, historians agree that 1 Thessalonians is among one of Paul's very, very first epistles that he's written. Some believe it was his very first. But many believe that it could have been written as early as 51, certainly by about 53 or 54 AD, when you think about the fact that Paul was converted some eight or nine years after the establishment of the church, and the years that he spent in his travels and preparation, and by the time he would go on the second journey, and now writing a letter to the church at Thessalonica, what I find very interesting about this is that not a whole lot of time had lapsed from the time that, that the congregation is established in the second journey in Acts 17. And it becomes a congregation, these brethren are working, and now Paul writes this letter to them. And I just want us to think about the time factor. And then think about what Paul has said about the church in Thessalonica when we go back to our original text now in 1 Thessalonians. Take your Bibles and go back to 1 Thessalonians chapter 1. <clears throat> Don't you find it interesting? <clears throat> when Paul says again in verse 2, chapter 1, 1 Thessalonians, We give thanks to God always for you all, making mention, mention of you in our prayers. Remembering without ceasing your work of faith, labor of love, and patience of hope in our Lord Jesus Christ in the sight of our God and Father, knowing, beloved brethren, your election by God. There's so many things that we could say about that, but as we highlight, particularly verse 3, verse number 3, Paul enumerates three vital actions coupled with three essential virtues that are needed for spiritual success in any congregation. And it is here that I believe that the church at Thessalonica serves as a model for church growth, spiritually and numerically. The spiritual growth that they had as brethren as they grew in the Lord, in their relationship in the Lord, even in their knowledge of God's word, and their relationships with one another spiritually, but then also numerically because of their evangelistic mindset. Even though they had experienced or begun with what we might refer to as very humble beginnings in that second journey. You see, it was immediately fraught with some problem, but there were converts and there are people that believed they accepted what Paul preached about the gospel of Jesus Christ. And though he had to leave, and I tell you what, he had to leave at night, didn't he? The situation that had arisen was so bad that he had to get out of town, he had to leave. I would suppose that Paul would have liked to have been able to stay there a little longer and work with them and encourage them and give them some more teaching, but he had to go. But now this time, this short period of time goes by, and look what's happening to the congregation up there in Thessalonica. And so when I say three vital actions, those actions are seen in the words work and labor, which has to do with travail, and patience. Those are actions. This work and labor and patience, but those three actions are coupled with these essential virtues, the virtues of faith, and love and hope. This is where I want us to think about the Thessalonian model that we see in this passage, particularly verse number three. Now, I want you to think about this as well, and I think most of you know this in your studies, in your reading of the New Testament and studies. That the Apostle Paul frequently, think about this, he frequently linked these words together. Faith, hope, and love. In fact, if I were to ask you what probably is one of the most famous passages in the Bible and where that is even found, and it would take us to 1 Corinthians 13. Remember the chapter of love? And as he talks about the enduring nature of love and the qualities and the definition of love, he says, now abide faith, hope, and love, and the greatest of these is love. But isn't it interesting how he puts that together? Faith, hope, and love. Uh, he had done the same thing already, uh, we know, again, in, in, 
in other passages. But even in 1 Thessalonians, over in chapter 5 and at verse 8, if you flip over a few pages, but in chapter 5 and verse 8, he says, But let us who are of the day be sober, putting on the breastplate of faith and love, and as a helmet, the hope of salvation. There's all three of them. Uh, just flip back a couple of pages to Colossians chapter 1. Colossians chapter 1, beginning at verse number 3. And when Paul writes to the church at Colossae, he says, We give thanks to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, praying always for you since we heard of your faith in Christ Jesus and of your love for all the saints because of the hope which is laid up for you in heaven of which you heard before in the word of the truth of the gospel. Faith, hope, and love. This is something that Paul has commonly done because, again, these are very, very important virtues or principles. But notice what he does. So we go back to our text in 1 Thessalonians chapter 1, and let's look at verses 3 and 4 again. He says, Remembering without ceasing your work of faith, labor of love, and patience of hope in our Lord Jesus Christ in the sight of our God and Father, knowing, beloved brethren, your election by God. What I want to do is just a very simple exercise this evening. And to bring out these actions that are coupled with these wonderful qualities, these principles, or these virtues. And the very first thing that we want to see in this, we deal, and I think this is a point that he's making is he talks about work that is produced by faith. Remembering you always. You know, Paul, he had so many people that he thought about and that he prayed for, and, and those aren't just words. How many times do we read in Scripture where he says, remembering you and being thankful for you and praying for you? Uh, he had an incredible, you know, sometimes we make prayer lists, right? He had an incredible prayer list. When he says, remembering you always. But one of the things that he remembered, it says, your work of faith. And when I was thinking about that, work produced by faith. Because faith, and we have this very common word that's used in the scripture, pistis. Faith, and it's a conviction, it's a belief. But the whole point that we find in Scripture, and it's true in Paul's writings, it's true in James' writing, we see it's true in many places, then listen to me, faith is to be active, not static. Faith is to be active, it works. And you talk about another common word, by the way, we think, well, faith is such an important common word, but so is, so is the word work, ergos. I mean, when we look at this, this is a word that is found over and over. It's found used by Jesus many times in the Gospels, in the, in the Gospels of the writings, that, or rather the sayings of Jesus. It is found in the writings of the New Testament, in the epistles. And it's this word that just deals with work. It's the word as we understand work. That we have to go to work, that we get busy with work. Now what he's saying in this, in, in the expression... Your work of faith. Your work of faith. How many times do we see that even in the, a lot of the evangelical community today, people want to always put kind of faith on one side of the issue or column and work on another side as though that there is no connection or correlation between them. Do you know what I'm talking about in that? It's almost like we have this choice that you're either going to accept that our relationship with God is on the basis of faith or our relationship with God is the basis of work. And as though we've got to make this grandiose type of separation. When we look at faith in the Bible, I don't care if it's examples of the Old Testament or the examples that we have in the New Testament of the disciples of Christ, the early Christians. Do we not see a constant correlation between true faith and then work compliance of doing what God says? You see that correlation all the time. You see faith again is to be active. It's not a faith that's going to be static. It's not a faith that just stands still. It is a faith that works. The Bible emphasizes faith and works combined. In fact, Jesus said, Jesus himself said in John 6, 29. And he has offered some incredible challenges in John chapter 6. In John 6, he's telling people, and a lot of people had come, they wanted to be fed by him. 
They've been fed before. They'd like to be fed again. But he wants them to understand that they're going to truly follow after Jesus. He says, you've got to be willing. You've got to be willing to eat my flesh, drink my blood. That is, you've got to imbibe him. You've got to take him in. You've got to, you've got to totally commit to Christ. That's his point. But he says something very interesting in John chapter 6 and verse 29. Jesus answered and said to them, This is the work of God that you believe in him whom he sent. This is the work of God that you believe. Is there a rather large contingency of people out in the religious world today that again, that want to totally separate belief from work and again, that there's no correlation, that there's no connection. And here's Jesus saying, this is the work of God that you believe. You know what? To believe in God, to believe the Lord, and which means to follow him, even that belief, does that not take effort and diligence on our part? It's not some type of just mere mental assent to something. Work produced by faith. And this is what was going on in Thessalonica. You see, the growth that took place in the church of Thessalonica didn't happen accidentally. It didn't happen just naturally. It didn't happen because people did not diligently do things. We understand it was work produced by faith. They had faith. They had total trust and conviction in the Lord. And now that work produced by that faith, that faith was that motivation. Okay, Hebrews chapter 11. What do we all know about Hebrews chapter 11? It's the chapter of what? Faith. You have, you have that, that, that definition in Hebrews 11. 1. Now, now faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. You have its essential nature in verse number 6, Hebrews 11, 6. But without faith it is impossible to please him. For he who comes to God must believe that he is and that he's a reward of those who diligently seek him. Faith, faith. But then what does the writer do? He gives these multiple examples. Men like Abel, Noah, Abraham, Moses. You have these faithful men and women that are talked about in Hebrews chapter 11. And when the writer goes to each of these individuals, these great Old Testament characters, we simply understand that the scripture says, the inspiration reveals, by faith, dot, 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 they did something. By faith, Abel did what? Offered a more acceptable sacrifice than Cain did. By faith, did he do something? By faith, Noah built an ark to the saving of his household. By faith, you look at all of these characters, and again, I want to say, you see, work produced by faith is what this obedience and this compliance is all about. No, it has nothing about us being able to save ourselves and for us to do some kind of work by which we don't need God and we can just do it ourselves and then be able to look at God and say, God, you'll save me because I deserve it, because I've earned it, because I've worked for it. That's not what that's saying. But I'll tell you what else it's not saying. It's not saying that work is just a mere mental ascent without us complying to the will of God. Both of those extremes are tragically wrong. You're all very familiar with James chapter 2. You know, in James, in James chapter 2 and verses 14 through 26... And as you think about James 2, let me ask you something. Do we think for a moment that James is trying to contradict any other scripture? Do we think that James is trying to be in conflict with what the Apostle Paul wrote, you know, in the book of Romans or his letter to the Ephesians or anywhere else? We know better than that. Most likely this is the James, the brother of the Lord. This is with the James that seemed to be one of the chief leaders in the city of Jerusalem, the congregation, the church in Jerusalem, that found himself in and out with the apostles. He was with them a lot. And, and here we look in James chapter 2, and, and, and he gives all of this teaching about the whole point that faith without works is dead. 
Because again, faith is not to be static. Faith is not just to stand alone or be alone. It's never a matter of being faith only or faith alone. And how many times have we even made the point that when you drop on down to verse 24 in James 2, do you see it there? Do you see it there? James chapter 2, verse 24. You see that a man is justified by works and not by faith only. Is James trying to say that a man's justified by works without faith? No. But one thing he's making crystal clear, let no one say that you are justified by faith alone. Because that concept of faith alone, it's not just a problem today, it was a problem back then. It's been a problem for centuries and centuries and centuries. Because there are people that say, oh, I believe and oh, I'm a person of faith. But when they're not willing to do what Jesus said, Jesus would say in Luke 6, 46, he says... Why do you call me Lord, Lord, and then do not do the things which I say? How many ways does James need to illustrate it? He uses an example of Abraham and offering Isaac. He uses an example of Rahab and sending the spies the other way. When you look at these Old Testament situations, and what he's trying to show is that faith without works is dead. Faith without works is dead. The church in Thessalonica had become a model because of the kind of faith that they had and work was produced by that faith. No wonder the Apostle Paul said in 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 7, for we walk by faith and not by sight. It's our total reliance and dependability upon, uh, dependability upon God, right? We rely upon God. Work produced by faith. Now, he goes to a different word. And when we think of work here again, it's almost like going to work from the standpoint of going to our jobs. And there will be a lot of you, a good number of you, that tomorrow will have to go to work. And so we have that concept in our mind about, yes, things we have to do. They become responsibilities, and we need to be diligent in it. But now he goes to something that is very intense, and he uses the word labor. And he wants them to understand and us to appreciate even today that when you look at the church of Thessalonica, that they had gone through much labor or travail, and that labor was prompted by love. You go back to our text in, 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 in 1 Thessalonians chapter 1 and verse 3, and what does he call it? He says he calls it, yes, he's talked about this whole work of faith, but now labor of love. Now we look at, at, the, at the expression, and it's labor prompted by love, and the love that he uses is agape. Clearly, it's agape. It's this giving, this sacrificial, not even expecting anything in return necessarily, it, 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 is, it is one of the most defining words that could be used in any kind of a relationship, that a relationship that we have with God, a relationship we have with one another. And when we talk about agape love, and all of us are, are, are kind of familiar with that agape, that word agape. But here's a word, kapos, that's labor. And there's a few different words that are used, and there's even a different word that talks about labor when it comes to pregnancy, because I thought about that too. And those of you gals, ladies, moms that have been through labor in that way, you know what I'm talking about. But what you're saying is, yes, Brent, but do you know what we're talking about? And I have to be real honest. No, I don't. Now, if I ever do have a kidney stone, I remember when Vicki had a kidney stone years ago in Bakersfield, she told me that it was worse than giving birth to the three babies that she did. So my point is, I guess if I ever have a kidney stone and have to pass a kidney stone, then maybe I'll be able to say, okay, I kind of get it. But what I want you to understand is that this is a word labor that has something to do with, it's even associated, and kapas has associated actually with pain. It's associated with pain from the standpoint that, yes, something is laborious, but there is pain involved. There's travail that is involved. And, and when it says... Again, when we look at the text, he calls it a labor of love. Now, we use that expression from time to time, don't we? We say, oh, it's a labor of love. 
Okay, how many of you are go actually going to a job tomorrow? How many are going to work tomorrow? I mean, okay. You three work at the same place, don't you? It's a labor of love, huh? Yeah, no, those are all funny looks you're giving me. Typically, when somebody goes to a job like that, and, and, we, and you know, it's not necessarily a labor of love. But now, so let's forget about that. But let's talk about now, and, that, and, and, and being parents again, moms and dads, and I want to ask you, raising children, raising children, is that laborious? Is that labor? And can it even involve some pain and travail? Yeah, the smiles get bigger even. But you look at this, and is it a labor of love? Shake your head in the affirmative. It's a labor of love. Now, there are things in this life that are laborious, that they are truly labor, that even go beyond the normal idea of work, but now labor because there may be travail, and there is pain, and there is sacrifice, there are difficulties, it takes time, it takes energy, it takes all of these things that can happen at a job, but even to a greater extent in certain things in life that we deem very, very important, particularly in relationships. And we look at this, and someone says, how could you do that? And I'll tell you what's really interesting. When it comes to raising children, I'd be willing to do it all over again. I, if I am going to do it all over again, I want to be young again. But the point is, is that there is no doubt that as I look at it, that raising children is laborious. It takes work, but, and, and, and it is painstaking kind of work. But I would do it again. I love being a parent. I think I love being a grandparent even more. But I love being a parent, and I have no problem in saying that raising our children, I think Vicki would agree with me, that it was a labor prompted by love. Now, this is where we're to be in our relationship with God and all of the other spiritual responsibilities or duties that we have. Being a Christian, being a disciple of Jesus, being a worker in the Lord's church is laborious if we do it correctly. Would you agree? But hopefully we don't look at it as something that is just purely agonizing and something that we look at as being negative and something we wish, oh, I didn't wish I didn't have to do this or go through this or have this. I would hope that we would look at it and say, no, this labor is prompted by love. Am I making the point okay? You know what this is all about? An attitude and a different mindset. I mean, I, I probably should have had Clint lead a couple of the, you know, the work type songs that I want to be a worker for the Lord. And if we're going to sing that with the spirit and the understanding, I mean, I hope we wouldn't, you know, I mean, hope we wouldn't sing that and have a scowl on our face. That we would truly mean it that I want to be a worker for the Lord because that kind of work that can be, yes, intensely laborious should be prompted by this agape love. You know what? Love prompts us to do the difficult task. It does. There are so many applications, and while Paul had an intention in 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 14, and he's talking about what God has done for us through his son Jesus Christ, and what we should be doing for the Lord, what we should be doing for others, even in benevolence. And there are a lot of things that he's appealing to the Corinthians that they need to be doing for the Lord. And, and, and he wants them to know that it should be a labor of love to the Corinthians, just like the Thessalonians are doing. But I love that expression in the first part of 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 14, where he says, for the love of Christ compels us. Do you find anything in this life compelling? Now, it's back to you three characters. You're going to work tomorrow. I'm not sure that it's love that compels you. It's probably a paycheck that compels you. Am I right or am I right? I mean, in a lot of situations, that's the case, isn't it? We're compelled because of a paycheck, and we're compelled because we have to pay bills, and we're compelled because we want to eat. We're compelled because we want to live and survive. We get that. And that's not necessarily wrong. In fact, it's not wrong. But when Paul talks about our duties before God, for the love of Christ compels us. 
our attitude needs to be even towards difficult tasks that may be painful. Then we look at this and say, the love of Christ compels me. When I think about the love of God, I think about the love of Christ. When I think about what God has done for me, that fact alone compels me to do the right thing. Just how compelling is true love? Now let's leave the work, and I'll, I'm leaving you three alone. I'm leaving you alone. I'm going to talk about relationships, and I can very much talk about relationships. But I'm going to leave you alone, and I'll talk about Brent and Vicky. Again, you talk about that, how compelling is true love? And I mean, even when... Vicky and I were first dating, and, I, and, and when the, the relationship's developing, and we fell in love, and that love compelled us in so many different ways. And that we couldn't wait to be with each other, to see each other, to do things. It got to the point because that we knew that we loved each other, and, and we didn't even want to wait as far as, as wait till you're finished with college to get married. That was a suggestion that Paul Fields gave me many, many years ago. All right. And I just started college. And I said, no. <laughs> okay. And I tell you, is love a very compelling force? It is in relationships. Now think about the relationship that we have with God and the relationship that we have with each other's brethren. And think about how we should feel towards the lost or feel towards the needy. It is here that that principle kicks in for the love of Christ. The love of Christ compels us. It is a motivating force that moves one to passionate labor. And the greatest example is the example of God himself. The whole John 3.16, the whole Romans 5.8 situation, that God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. Was God's love compelling? So much so that he gave his only begotten son in Romans 5.8, but God demonstrates his own love toward us, and that while we were still sinners, yet Christ died for us. And so we have passages like Romans 12 that challenge us as Christians that we need to be involved in kapas, in labor that's prompted by love. Romans 12 and verse 9, let love be without hypocrisy. Verse 10, be kindly affectionate to one another with brotherly love and honor giving preference to one another. Not lagging in diligence, verse 11, fervent spirit serving the Lord, rejoicing in hope, patient in tribulation, continuing steadfastly, all of these things. Look at verse 13, distributing to the needs of the saints, given to hospitality, people that are in need, and the love of Christ compels us to take care of these issues. Before we go to our final point, it's troubling to think that anybody, especially that is a Christian and that has been saved by the gospel of Jesus Christ, can see the serious needs that are in the world today, that there are lost people all over our communities, that are our neighbors, our friends, our fellow workers, fellow students, and does the love of Christ compel us to be involved in the painstaking labor that can be really difficult at times. It's a difficult task to share the gospel and not to be so compelled to try to do what we can do in sharing the gospel or to find out that there are people in need and not do what we can do. What a model. Work produced by faith, labor prompted by love, and we close with this thought because it all takes patience. Back in our text of 1 Thessalonians 1 verse 3, and patience of hope in our Lord Jesus Christ, in the sight of our God and Father. Patience, inspired by hope. And what some beautiful words here. When we look at the words that sometimes are translated as patience, even endurance, it is a real close kin to long-suffering even. But as we look at the word hupomone, hupomone, impatience, but that patience, and we know what patience is, we don't have to give any really fancy definitions of some Greek word. I think we understand what it means or what, and the needs of being patient. Patience inspired by hope. 
And many of us are very familiar with Elpis. The happy and confident expectation of better things to come. That's what hope is. Hope is not a wish. Hope is a favorable confidence of better things to come. And so hope inspires patience, especially in times of difficulty. And we're involved in work, and we're involved in labor, and we need patience. But here's where we need to get it as I close. But we've got to get this, and I just cannot gloss over this point. Not hope necessarily. Listen to me, you've got to listen to this point. Not hope of a better earthly life, but hope for heaven. Okay, you know what we say sometimes, say getting down to brass tacks, or we'll say when the rubber hits the road, right? Getting right down to it. Who here would like to have, just when it comes to life in this earth, who here would like to have a better life? I, I suppose all of us would say we'd like to have a better life. I can't promise you that. And the Lord's not necessarily even promising you that. Do you suppose that the Christians in the New Testament era that faced incredible amounts of tribulation and persecution, do you suppose that they would have liked to have been able to have a better life? A life that was persecution free or at least a life where they didn't have to worship in secret. Where they had to be worried about the persecution, the sword of persecution. Of where their jobs were taken away and their wealth or their money and their properties were taken away. Or where persecution severely was inflicted upon their friends or their children. Do you suppose that they would have liked to have had a better life? And those that look and say, well, if you just obey the gospel, you have a better life. Oh, I believe that we'll have a better life than in our relationship with God. But that doesn't necessarily mean that we'll have an easier life. I think people confuse that all the time. When we're talking about hope, we're not talking about having a better bank account. We're not talking about having a bigger house or a nicer car. We're not even talking about having better health. You know, a lot of us. I don't, I'm going to ask Jesse, Jesse, wouldn't you love just to be able to get out of that wheelchair and walk? Gave him the wrong service, buddy. <laughs> I know, Jesse and I, we, we met the other day, and we were talking about that very thing. But he misses the ability to do what he's done in the past. Who would not want to have something better like that? But that's not what Paul's talking about. Because and I don't mean to be doomsday. I hope that you get stronger and get better. We'd love to see you get out of that wheelchair. We'd love to see that right hand and arm just get stronger and stronger. Huh? But that's not what he's talking about. It's not necessarily a better life here on earth. It's talking about a hope for heaven. Because you know what? We're only going to live here so long and we're all going to face death. And I'll tell you what, we're growing older and the outward man is decaying. We are decaying. But as a Christian, are we to be renewed day by day? Because that's a hope of heaven. And I believe with all my heart, Jesse, that you're going to be running on your own in heaven if you will please allow me to use that metaphor. You see, this is what Peter refers to as a living hope in 1 Peter. Chapter 1 and verse 3. Blessed be the God and Father, Lord Jesus Christ, who according to his abundant mercy has begotten us again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead to an inheritance incorruptible and undefiled that does not fade away, reserved in heaven for you. Was that not the Apostle Paul's hope? As he's in a prison, do you think that Paul really wanted to be in a prison? But he wasn't waiting for God to send angels to open dungeon doors so that he could just flee. But what Paul says in 2 Timothy chapter 4 and verse 8, a very short period of time before he's executed, before he's beheaded, he says, finally there is laid up for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will give to me on that day, and not to me only, 
but also to all who have loved his appearing. That's hope. You know what Paul had said earlier when he had written to the Romans in Romans chapter 5 and verse 5? And it is so important, it is so strong, it is so relevant. He says, now hope does not disappoint. So I have one thing to say about that. Since the hope that God has given us and promised us us does not disappoint, let's not ourselves disappoint God. Work produced by faith, labor prompted by love, patience inspired by hope. Paul says, Thessalonians, I remember you. I cease not to, to remember you, to pray for you, to be thankful for you because of this. What a model. And then he said this about him as we look in verse 8 of our text. He says, for from you, for from you the word of the Lord has sounded forth, not only in Macedonia and a cave to the south, but also in every place. Your faith toward God has gone out so that we do not need to say anything. Your reputation has gone out. Here is this congregation that had humble beginnings, a rough start in many respects, and yet look what they have become. And ladies and gentlemen, if we understand and can see that they could do that by God's help that they could do that can we not do the same today can we this is what all this did for the Thessalonian church and I believe that it can be done for us today as well and I've said enough thank you very much I hope that you will take to heart these are encouraging words that Paul has written and we need to be encouraged that we can do the same thing today we really can and it's wonderful we extend you the invitation of Jesus Christ become a part of a fellowship that wants to do this let's work together let's labor together let's love together let's do these things being patient in all this and if we can help you in any need that you have and obeying the gospel whatever that may be come at this time so we stand so we sing the song that has been so